Good afternoon and welcome back everyone to our options education webinar series, a, series, a very special edition of it, where we have a very special guest, Dan Passarelli, uh, to talk about options trading from a different perspective as a market maker. So first of all, before we get started, I just wanted to say a huge thank you and a welcome to Dan for joining us this afternoon. Um, Tony, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, really glad to be here. Um, so before we get started and jump into answering some of your burning questions regarding options trading from a market maker's perspective, let's just start off with a quick disclaimer. What we are going to discuss here today is purely for education and demonstration purposes. It is not a solicitation or recommendation to buy or sell any of the specific securities that we may be talking about here during today's session. So we're gonna cover quite a few different things, but first I wanna just quickly introduce Dan and give him an opportunity to talk a little bit about his background and why it's so unique with the questions that many of us may have as traders and talking a little bit about his transition actually from trading on the floor as a market maker to being on the same side of the, uh, of the trade as you are, being on this side of the screen uh, and really getting his market maker's perspective as to kind of what's different between trading on the floor versus trading uh, on, you know, from a retail perspective. Uh, last week, we talked a little bit about payment for water flow. So let's uh, hopefully ask some questions about that and his thoughts around payment for water flow and just what that provides for the, uh, the industry. And then we'll show you kind of the education schedule that Dan will be providing here in, during the month of November and we'll answer some of your questions here at the very end. Now, for those of you that have not uh, heard the news so far or have not joined us over the past uh, week or so where I've announced this, but part of the reason that I'm bringing Dan on during today's session is because my wife and I are expecting our first child in the next couple of weeks. And during that time, we want to make sure that we provide continuity in terms of education and content for you guys so that you understand and are able to utilize the resources here at Options Play. So today I want to introduce Dan so that when I am taking a few weeks off, that Dan is going to be stepping in so that you are familiar with who he is. Um, and you're not going to say, who is this guy who's now all of a sudden teaching me options? So with that, I want to welcome Dan. He is a trader and author and a world-renowned trading expert and a former member of the CBOE and the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. He's a frequent contributor on Bloomberg, uh, Bloomberg, Fox News, and CBO TV and a resource to journalists. And he's invited as a speaker for plenty of organizations such as NASDAQ, CBO, uh, CME Group, Fidelity, TradeStation, Distreet.com, Shanghai Futures Exchange, just to name a few. And he is also a musician and a world traveler. And I'm learning something new about him, uh, even though I've known Dan for many years, that he is a marathon runner. I did not know that about you, Dan, but welcome. Um, a big welcome for you. And, and thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Yeah, Tony, I'm super excited to be here. Uh, and hey, great to meet all the folks here. Uh, I noticed somebody said welcome and uh, I feel welcome. So thanks for having me. Um, perfect. So Dan, let's talk a little bit about your background, you know, as a floor trader, right? Um, you were a, a trader on both the CBOE and as a floor trader. So I want to talk a little bit about kind of what really is different between the two, right? And kind of what did you do as a market maker and how did you transition to, to trading on the other side of the screen? Because, you know, we've heard a lot of stories about floor traders struggling to, to be profitable, uh, you know, trading their own capital uh, on, on this side of as a retail trader, if you will. So could you talk us a little bit about kind of your background on the floor and kind of what, what is different about the two and how did you transition from trading on the floor versus trading, you know, as a retail trader yourself? Uh, sure, Tony. They are very, very different um, jobs, I guess we'll say. Uh, being a floor trader and being a retail trader, they're, they're kind of, uh, in some ways, they're kind of opposites, but in some ways, they're just sort of um, just these different things that are, are completely unrelated. A lot of people think that that the, the the market maker is your enemy if you're trading from a retail platform, which nothing can be further from the truth for 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 most of the relationship. Uh, in a lot of ways, the market maker is is your friend. In a lot of ways, it, if the market maker makes money, it doesn't mean you lose money. You can both make money on a trade because market makers hedge; they trade delta neutral. Um, the one thing you are competing against them on is the bid ask spread. So I'm getting a little ahead of myself, 
let me start talking about exactly what I did on the CBOE trading floor when I was trading as a market maker. So what market makers do is provide liquidity. Uh, and that seems pretty esoteric, I think. Um, but, but really, it's, it's fairly simple. When you log into your trading platform and you see the bids and the offers of all the different options on whatever the stock is, it's typically market makers that are providing those. Uh, and, and when I say providing those, it's providing both the, the bid and the offer. You know, for example, uh, I'm looking at my screen right now in, um, you know, United Airlines, the, the November 5th, 45 calls, they're 240 bid at 267. And they both have a little B next to them. They're both on the, the, the bid and the offers on the box. There is probably one single market maker there who's both 240 bid and 267 offer, who doesn't care if he buys or sells these options. Because the market makers, they don't care about direction because as soon, like, like let's say that I'm the market maker and someone comes in and sells me 10 of those, of those calls at $2.40, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to hedge. I'm going to sell short shares of United Airlines to get what's called Delta neutral. So now all my directional risk is gone. And that's why the market makers don't have to care if they buy or sell calls. They don't care about the direction. So logical question that you may be asking yourself is, well, how do they make money then? Because if I buy those calls now at 240, maybe somebody will come and buy them from me at 267 and I'll just take off the hedge and I'll lock in that 27 cents. Now that's a perfect situation. That probably happened to me about three times in my entire market making career. Uh, what's a little bit more realistic if, is if I buy those calls at 240 and I hedge them, maybe somebody will come in and buy some other calls or maybe some puts and I can spread off my, my Greeks risk because I'm still gonna have gamma and theta and vega for those of you who are familiar with those. And so as long as I'm always buying the bid and selling the offer, I'm always locking in what's called a theoretical profit. Now, usually if we're talking about a theoretical profit, uh, you know, it, it, it sounds like it's not real, but it is because the more of these trades where I'm buying this, this lower price and selling this higher price, if I just do that over and over and over again, that ends up becoming real money. Um, so that's what market makers do. Now, retail traders, I think I'm preaching to the choir, right? Um, I think many of you are retail or institutional traders. And, and, and we do, and, and that's what I am now we do something very, very different, right? We position trade. We look at United Airlines and say, hey, uh, you know, just for example, I think uh, there's some support here and we see some momentum taking place. Um, the slow stochastics indicate that it's oversold and I wanna buy it, just for example. And so I'll, I'll come up with an option strategy that I plan out to be able to take the best advantage of that. So like these are very different things. And my transition from going from market maker to, to retail trader, um, honestly, it took a little bit of time, but I'm so glad that I had that experience as a market maker because it helped me be a better retail trader. And it helps me to teach our retail traders and, and, and I'll have the honor of, of, of working with you guys for the next, uh, you know, as soon as we get started. Um, it, it enables me to help share these, these more deep things that helps all retail traders do their job better. And I was thinking about this earlier today when I was out on a run, and uh, it's actually been a bit since I ran a marathon, <laughs> but I've ran a few. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I was out on a short run today, and I was thinking about it. I was thinking that it's sort of like, like, if, if someone has a job and they work on building race cars and then they decide to become a race car driver, those are two very different things. And one doesn't guarantee success in the other, but if I'm a race car driver and I really know the inner workings of how this machine works, 
I could end up being a better race car driver. I think that's a fantastic perspective to provide. And, and I think this is really kind of what I, what I want to try to dive into a little bit more here is because there is this still perception that market makers are on the other side of a retail trade, right? Um, and, and this is something that um, sometimes actually discourages some traders from trading. You know, I've heard every, all, all types of um, concerns from retail traders asking, uh, it seems like every time I place my order near the midpoint, the midpoint seems to move after I place my trade. And, it, you know, they, this almost feels like this cat and mouse game between you and the market maker. Um, so I'm really glad that you were able to provide us a little bit perspective in terms of you know, what it is that the market maker does on the other side. And, and I think the, the, the most important thing to remember here is that the market maker really doesn't care whether you're buying or selling, right? A lot of investors feel that if I'm buying, then the market maker must be selling to me and they must have a specific view. But remember, uh, a market maker is taking the opposite side of whatever you want to trade. They're actually, in theory, at a somewhat disadvantage because they may not want to be buying the calls that you want to sell or vice versa, um, but they have to hedge their... Uh, themselves after placing that trade in order to, uh, in theory, make the difference between the bid-ask spread. But largely, that's in theory what the market maker is trying to do, is make the spread between the bid and the ask price versus where you are on the other side actually taking that liquidity. Um, so I think always, I always think the best way to think about this is really kind of a market, a, a retail trader typically is taking liquidity from the markets versus a market maker is providing liquidity from the markets. And as you saying, as you were saying, Dan, you know, the, the the, the retail trader is trying to profit from an opportunity, a specific position that they want to, a specific view that they have in the market versus a market maker is really trying to profit from making both sides of the spreads, buying from you at a lower price and hopefully selling it to someone else at a slightly higher price and making the difference between the two. And, and a market maker needs to do this over and over again, over thousands and thousands of trades. Um, so, and, you know, Dan, from when, when you were a floor trader, you were doing this by hand, uh, you know, to some degree or with the help of a computer on some of these trades. Nowadays, market making is in theory the same, just at a, at a much faster pace and, and purely electronic these days. You know, what's your view on terms of, you know, how market makers have evolved uh, since you were on the floor and kind of what advantages does that provide to the market maker? And what advantages do you think that might provide to the retail trader? Yeah, this sure has been a changing business, um, ever changing business, really. Uh, and, and I was fortunate enough to see the, the bulk of the transition from largely manual uh, in person to largely electronic. But the thing is, is that like the underlying concept is, is still the same. And it, and it always will be. It, it kind of has to be. Um, what, what market makers have always done and still do is they run a theoretical value and buy below it and sell above it. Now that's what's the same. What's different is that now it's a whole lot faster. <laughs> um, you know, it used to be someone would uh, call their broker who would call the phone clerk who would send a runner out to the pit to give to the broker and make this trade. Now information is so much faster. And that provides a lot of benefits, I mean, really to everybody. Everybody's sort of role in this changed a little bit, right? Um, retail traders probably had a lot more time to, um, you know, there was no rush. Uh, they, they had a little bit of time to think about it, which, which could be good and could be bad if they really wanted to get it done. Now all a retail trader has to do is push a button. With market makers, um, it required more manpower before. Uh, and I say manpower because it was largely men, to tell you the truth, back then. Um, now it's, it's just all about brains instead of brawn. And there's, uh, there's plenty of female market makers as well. And um, instead of standing in a pit and, and doing uh, this sort of more physical activity, we simply enable machines to help us. Um, we, we program computers so that the computer can say, okay, here's my theoretical value and let's generate bids and offers on hundreds, sometimes thousands of different options. And so market makers these days are really able to leverage this technology to be able to do more and, and to be able to, to provide more liquidity to more people. 
Yeah, and and now with with the invent of this electronic market making, you now have access to far more expirations, strike prices, and listings on pretty much everything you could possibly think of trading outside of the really small cap stocks. You can find you know, a, a ton of options with strike prices, you know, with the exact deltas that you're really looking for, the exact exposure you're looking for. It's really a benefit to you as a retail trader. Um, I do want to discuss a little bit about this, this concept of theoretical value, because it's something that I think is really important for uh, retail traders to understand the other side of the trade, how market makers think and why the bid ask prices are what you see on the screens, right? So let's use a basic example of, let's say, a bid ask spread at uh, that's currently trading at 90 cents by a dollar a 10 with the midpoint at exactly $1. Um, could you walk us through a little bit about kind of how a market maker thinks about re uh, theoretical value and when the retail trader steps in and places an order inside of the bid ask spread, how does a market maker decide, hey, this is a trade that I want to trade against, or this is an order that I will be willing to fill? Sure. Yeah. Like that is the key. Like when you say thinks about it, like that really is the key. The way a market maker sort of envisions this is he thinks this, this option is worth one dot. And I've always felt like the word theoretical in, in theoretical value is just such a misleading thing. Um, there's, a, there's a few terms and options that I, I, that I wish if I, if I were king, I would change. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, th this theoretical value, like market makers look at it like this is what it is worth. And if I buy below it, I have this sort of edge. Um, and and it's a it's a theoretical edge, but I know if it's worth a dollar, if if then later I sell it, even if I sell it at a dollar, I'm locking in a profit. But because there's there's so many different options listed on any one given stock, like um, you know Tony mentioned before, he on that slide spreads. It's really all about spreads, both bid ask spreads and spreads among the different options. Uh, if I buy a bid in one and I sell an offer in another, I'm locking in that spread at a at 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 a positive value. Like just imagine if if you, the retail trader, those of you who've been trading for a bit, what if all your credit spreads that you sold, you could sell on the offer instead of the bid? Imagine how much more profitable you could be. Well, that's the benefit that the market maker has. On the other side of that, the market maker is always taking arguably the wrong side of the trade. Like us retail traders now, we, we, we get to think about it. We get to study the charts. We get to do what's arguably smart, right? And, um, you know, Tony, one thing that we mentioned earlier that I, I wouldn't mind taking a deep dive on is this idea of how both the retail trader and the market maker can both win. Can I go down that rabbit hole? Absolutely, because I think that's a really important part. Um, there's still this, I think, for some retail traders, a concept of real a zero sum game that, and, and it comes from other markets, right? Especially if you look at some of like the FX markets, where especially when you're trading with against the firm, if you will, it is to some degree a bit of a zero sum game. But in the options market, it is quite different. The equity markets are quite different. So let's explore that how a market maker and a retail trader can both win on on effectively the same trade. Right. Um, so I'm looking at the number of folks in here, so I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you've ever done this, but in your mind, raise your hand and I bet I can predict with uh, somewhat of an accuracy what percentage of you would be raising your hands. Um, but pretend to raise your hand if you've ever treated, uh, let's say a covered call and the stock you know, it kind of went up close to the strike price, but then came back down and it, and it kind of moved around a fair amount, but never went through your strike and you made money on the call. Pretend hands go up, right? Lots of pretend hands. 80% of the room just pretend raise their hand. So let's kind of break that down to what actually happens with the retail trader and what happens with the market maker. So the retail trader, and, and I trade covered calls every day, right? The retail trader, when I sell a call and it, and it moves up, but it moves down and, and it experiences a little bit of volatility, but never goes through the strike price. And I, and I skate, I make money on that covered call. I'm happy. The only thing I really care about is that the stock stays under the strike price by expiration. That's all I care about. Now, 
when I sell those calls, and maybe it's that United Airlines call, maybe I own some of that stock and I sold some of those calls against it. The market maker who bought those calls hedges it, gets delta neutral. So now has what's called gamma and theta and vega. But let's talk, I'm going to talk a little bit superficially about this. I don't want to get really, really deep in, in this. Um, maybe if we have time later this month in my Greeks class or something, we can explore it if we have time at the end. But but if, if I'm a mark maker and I have this delta neutral position with what's called positive gamma, when, when the stock goes up and down, my delta changes. And in fact, when, when the stock goes up, the delta of my calls gets bigger, but the stock that I sold against it stays the same. So when the stock goes up, I, I end up having to sell more stock. And then when that stock goes back down, because remember in this case, it, it kind of moved around like this, right? So when the stock goes back down, now the delta of my call gets smaller and now I'm short too much stock. So I have to buy that stock back. So, so when, when these stocks do this oscillation, because market makers have this positive gamma in this example, they're, they're, they're forced, if they're going to be responsible and, and stay hedged, stay delta neutral, they're forced to sell stock when it's high and buy stock when it's low. And what that's called is gamma scalping. They end up making this money because of these fluctuations. Now they have theta too, and they have to make enough trading that gamma scalping to cover their theta. It's a little bit of a, there's some nuance to it, but here's the thing. If that stock moved around a fair amount and it didn't go through that strike price, you are going to win on your call. And the market maker can also win on that gamma scalping position. They're doing two different things. And, and like, like the, uh, in, in my, yeah, they're doing two different things and both can make money. Like it's sort of like there's two simultaneous uses for the options market. Like these two groups are doing these two completely different things with the exact same instruments. And so from that regard, yeah, both can win, both can lose, one can lose, one can win. And, and, and it doesn't matter. In that regard, the market maker is not your enemy. Uh, maybe not even necessarily a friend, they don't care about you. <laughs> I mean, I, I actually, I'm kind of back. it's true, but actually, um, you know, I could kind of take that back for a second because what they actually do want is they actually do want you to make money, uh, not necessarily because they like you, <laughs> they selfishly want you to make money so that you keep coming back and putting in more orders and so that this life cycle can continue. And, and I want to touch up on that in a little bit when we talk about payment for order flow, because it's one of the things that kind of makes this all go around. But I do want to go back and address that one question about theoretical value, because I do think it's a very important topic, right? So let's say you have and theoretical value. I think another way to think of this is fair value or what the option is worth, as you said, right? And many times we, as retail traders, we use the midpoint to help us determine what the theoretical value or what the fair value of an option is. Can you talk a little bit about why the midpoint is so good at telling us kind of the fair value what and the fact that market makers are effectively leaking us information through the bid ask price that is an that is actually an advantage in my opinion to retail traders to be able to get a sense for what the true value of an option is that these sophisticated algorithms that these market makers are running are, are giving us that information oh man yeah tony i love this oh this is so great so there's a couple components to, to, to this conversation. Um, so one thing to keep in mind is that uh, imagine you want to buy a call. Let's, let's get off United Airlines for a minute here. Let's talk about, oh, how about, um, how about, I don't know, how about Ford Motor Company? We'll get those up on my I know you can't see my screen, but I just like to have examples. Um, so let's say the uh, the Ford November 31 calls, um, or excuse me, the, the Ford November 19th, uh, 15 and a half calls, they're trading at 63 cents. Now, maybe I study a chart of Ford and I think that Ford is going to go higher. Okay, 
And I think that there is, oh, look at that. That's perfect. Thanks, Tony. Um, I'm, and, and, and let's say that this is a scenario where I think it can really run. And this is just hypothetical, okay? Uh, I'm just grabbing an example out of the air. So if I think it's really gonna run, I don't wanna use a spread. I just want to buy calls. Now I could buy those November 19th, 15 and a half calls, but would it really matter that much if I bought the November 19th, 15 calls? I mean, there's a little bit of a difference in Delta, tiny difference in Theta matters a little bit and i'm a big proponent of structuring your option positions just right to maximize and optimize the risk reward for you but look man truth be told it's not that big of a deal does it really matter that much if i buy the november 12th expiration not really or the december 16th expiration not really if it goes up like i think it will in this example I'm going to make pretty good money either way. One might be slightly better than the other. Okay, so where am I going with this? All the options on any one given stock, they are interrelated, okay? And so if, the, if, the, if I just look at what I will call the theoretical value of one option, I automatically can fill in the blanks for all the other options on that stock. Now that's a little bit of an oversimplification so far, right? Because there is a little bit of a difference and that's the implied volatility, okay? So the implied volatility, this is another one of those that if I were king, I would change the name of <laughs> because I don't think it's very descriptive. What implied volatility really means is it's the supply and demand pressure on option prices, okay? And it's called implied volatility because in, in theory, this time I'm using the classic use of the word theory, uh, that people buy and sell options based on their ex expectations of future volatility is the volatility implied by option prices. But really, in its purest sense, implied volatility is only the supply and demand pressure. Now, because they're all, all somewhat interrelated, if say earnings is coming out in, oh, I don't know, I don't, I don't wanna look it up right now, but if earnings is coming out in say two weeks in Ford, the options that expire immediately after that, those could be trading in a much higher implied volatility, right? Because more pe there's more demand for them. People want the ones that expire just after earnings, not the ones before earnings. They don't need those as a hedge. They want the ones that are just after earnings as a hedge. And so those can become relatively more expensive com compared with shorter term expirations. And then there's also, uh, and I know we're getting a little bit heady with this right now, but you know, I love talking about this stuff. And uh, for those who are more advanced in the audience, um, you, I, you'll probably pick it up on what I'm talking about. There's also a, a little bit of a difference in the supply and demand for the upside calls, because most people sell covered calls, uh, versus the downside puts, because there's greater demand for buying protection on the downside. So there's a little bit of a skew there. So bringing this a little bit more back to basic, all the options on any one given stock are all fairly interrelated. And if we can just get the value of one of them and get an idea for the supply and demand pressures on the ones that are relative to them, we can come up with the this this, this middle point, this fair value for every single option in the chain. And, and that, you know, Tony was mentioning, like, like we were able to get information from those market makers. If we are able to look at that and we are able to look at the different volatilities, we can see where more traders are buying or where more traders are selling options. We can see with, which expirations have more demand, which, uh, which strike prices have more demand. And we can really get a feel for what the market is doing. Um, and, and man, that's really, really powerful when you combine that with some other analytics as well. 
Um, so, and I think that's a really great um, point to make. And, and I, I wasn't even thinking that far ahead. I was just thinking about in a single option, but I, I'm glad that you made that, uh, that you shared that with us, because I think that's really tight, the type of perspective that we're looking for from someone who use, uh, who is a market maker. Uh, but what I was, uh, what I do want to address here is, you know, when we look at a fair value, let's go back to that 15 and a half uh, option that was trading at uh, 61 cents by 63 cents, right? Right? The market maker is basically saying, I'm willing to sell to you at 63. I'm willing to buy from you at 61. And this gives this leaks us the information of this midpoint, meaning the market maker is effectively as, as, as telling us that the fair value is 62 cents. They're, they're not telling us 62 cents. They're giving us these two pieces of information, 63 cents and 61 cents. And from that, we're able to calculate a mid price. This is what the market makers are assuming or is telling us is their, their assumption of the fair value of that option. And this gives us information to help us place our orders, right? And I think, you know, let, let's pull up something with a slightly wider spread, right? Something more than um, a, a one penny spread. Let's look at Apple at the money options. Let's look at this. This is 745 by 760, for example, right? This gives us a midpoint of 755, for example, as a, or you know, in this particular case, um, depending on where these options trade, these are not penny options. So uh, this gives us an opportunity to decide where we want to place our orders because we can place our orders inside of the spread, but it's important for us to use that midpoint to help us gauge where we want to place that order. And I'm curious, to, you know, from your perspective as a market maker, you know, when you have a theoretical value at 755 and someone says that I want to buy from, I want to buy at either 755, seven, let's say 756 versus 754. Um, kind of how do you think about these three orders that, that are in there to buy at these three prices if you deem the fair value at 755? How do you think about that as a market maker and how do you decide to interact with which specific order? Right, 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 right. So, um, so you know, when you go to buy a car and you bargain with the, the you know, the, the car salesman, and he says, well, I can't sell you this car because, you know, this is what we paid for the car from the factory. Like, like we would lose money if we sold it for less than this. And notwithstanding the fact that the car salesman might be lying to you, <laughs> but if that were true, which, which in this case it is true, right? The market maker, like, like, just like Tony said, like the market maker is giving you this value, value, like it's, it's implied right there for you uh, that anyone can see. And you know that, that market maker's business is buying below the value and selling above the value. If you want to, if you want to sell this, you're not going to be able to sell it above the value. Like there's no one in the world who's going to want to do that because that market maker would lose money. So, you know, like there is this symbiosis, right? Like, like because you're not really competing against each other, except for the bid ask spread. Like that is the one part that you are somewhat competing against the market maker. You, like the only way, like, you know, that the market maker needs to make a profit or else won't trade. So I know that if I'm going to sell this, I'm going to have to sell it a little bit below that fair value. If I'm going to buy it, I'm going to have to buy it a little bit above that fair value. Otherwise, I won't get the trade. And if the market moves, then I could end up, you know, selling at a much worse price or buying at a much worse price. So, yeah, like, yeah, that, that's great. I, I like, I, I love this. Yes. So one last question, you know, what's different between today versus when you were on the floor? Because today, if I place an order at 756 to buy on a name like Apple, I'll probably get filled immediately. If I sold at 754, I'll probably also get filled pretty much immediately on a name like Apple. You know, has that changed since you were on the floor? You know, were things this tight, you know, regardless of how, how wide the bid ask spreads were on the screen, were you filling orders a penny off the midpoint back then? Or are things just getting uh, faster? Are our executions happening um, at a better uh, price for, for all of, uh, uh, for all of um, effect for retail traders? Yeah, in in the in the really liquid names like Apple and Spiders and and a lot of those that are very liquid, um, yeah. I mean, 
back 10, 15, 20 years ago, you, you would not, you would not have gotten filled, uh, you know, selling at 754 or buying at 756. You just wouldn't have, um, you know, you would have either had to pay the offer or, you know, or, or the market would have just simply been wider and you would have had to pay closer to the offer. So yeah, in, in the liquid names, I think that things that the markets got a lot tighter and market makers, when you do middle them, they're much more willing to fill you closer to the, to the mid. Um, great. I'm, I'm really glad to hear that. And, th and I think that's a good transition to kind of the last thing that I want to talk to you about, which is something we had discussed in, you know, with, with traders over the, uh, you know, all the viewers here last week, which was the, the, the process for payment for water flow. There's been quite a bit of, of talks about this in the news right now, as far as the practice itself, whether it's good or bad for the industry, is it a conflict of interest? And more importantly, if it goes away, what happens to, to everyone, you know, does, does, what's our expectations? So my view on it last week that I spoke to traders um, that were viewers here today uh, was that, you know, payment for order flow, if you think about it on a per contract basis is a relatively small dollar amount that's being paid per contract. Uh, but on the flip side of that, it, uh, it, it allows brokerage firms to, to uh, be able to, um, make revenue from trades, not from the from the retail trader, but from the other side of the trade. And it's kind of this somewhat symbiotic relationship where you as a retail trader lower your commissions, you're more likely to trade more. The market makers like that because they're able to trade against your flow and make the money. As you say, both parties can make money. It's not just if I make money, the market makers lose money or vice versa. And the brokerage firms now, you know, instead of getting paid from the retail traders getting paid from the market makers. So kind of everyone is happy and there's more trading going on. That's my take on payment for order flow. And I'm concerned that if, if it goes away, you know, there's simply just going to be a higher cost to trade for retail traders. And I'm curious, to, you know, your thoughts on this, because I know not every market maker loves PFOV. And I'm just curious as to your views on this. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think it's, it's a very, very complicated issue. Um, you know, can people make a case on either side? Yeah, I think they can. But focusing focusing on what what you were just talking about, Tony, like what happens if it goes away? When 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 firms like um, you know Robinhood, where there's zero commissions, or a lot of the firms like, you know, Think or Swim Fidelity and all the other ones where the commissions are very, very low, much lower than they were, they're not doing that because, you know, because, I don't know, because they make it up on volume. I mean, yes, they do make some of it up on volume, but like they're, it is this symbiotic relationship, like Tony said, like they're, they're getting their profit from not you, but from the market maker and that enables them to uh, to pass on that lower commission to you, and some of the firms have rules with the with the people who are paying them for order flows, the market makers who are paying them for order flows, that they they have to uh, give a better price than what's on the screen. So we you know whether whichever side of this argument you tend to lean towards. And I think it's very, very difficult to lean very, very like a hundred percent on either side, but whichever side you like someone would lean on, on this, we have to acknowledge that there are, there are benefits to the retail trader in the sense that commissions are either zero or extremely low compared to what they were 10, 15 years ago, uh, even five years ago. And because the market makers aren't really competing against you for direction, you know, they're competing more against each other and they have these relationships with the firms where they have to give you a better price. It might be possible to make a case that your fills, at least in some cases, are better than the otherwise would be. So, um, yeah, that's uh, yeah. I could probably talk about this for another 10 hours, but those are my thoughts. Right. And, and my view is that your fills probably aren't as good if the brokerage firms aren't getting payment for order flow. But, you know, I, the, I go back to the example, you know, like, let's say you own Ford stock and you're selling that cover call for, uh, what was it, 60 cents? 
right? Back in the day, if you were paying 12, 13 bucks in commissions to sell uh, one contract of that Ford's covered call, you probably weren't even initiating that trade at all because you were only collecting $60 in income and now you're paying 12, 13 bucks in commissions, not quite worth it. I remember back in the day where, you know, a lot of cover calls, I just weren't, I wasn't initiating them because I was giving away a large chunk of it to the broker firm in commissions. It wasn't worth my time. Now that I pay 50, 60 cents a contract, even if I sell something for $40 in income for a hundred shares, I'll still do it. Look at my AT&T stock. I don't have that much stock, but I'm selling cover calls against it because I'm paying virtually zero commissions. And that, even if I give up a fraction of a penny on an execution, you know, which, you know, comes out to be, you know, it's not, it's not no money, right? There's still money there. But if I'm not paying that $10, you know, in commissions to initiate the trade, that's, I think, a relationship that is worth from worth it for me. That's my take on it. And uh, it sounds like you, to some degree, uh, agree that for retail traders, this is overall at the moment, while it sacrifices a small amount of execution quality for you, but the benefits, I think, outweigh that. Well, Dan, this has been a very, very enlightening and, and fun session. Um, thank you so much for joining us. And again, just to reiterate, um, you know, my wife and I are expecting our first child here in a couple of weeks. So during that time, we want to make sure that you as viewers have continuity in these education sessions. I normally host our education sessions on Thursday afternoons at 4.15 p.m. Um, once um, the baby comes, Dan will be stepping in for a few weeks of time. During that time, he will be hosting our education sessions on Wednesday at 4.15 p.m. So we're shifting it one day earlier for, to accommodate Dan's schedule. But Dan has already, Curtis, um, has given us the topics that he will be speaking on. So you will know what we're going to be, what he's going to be talking about. The first one, Dan, you're going to be talking about Option Greeks, really diving into some of the stuff that we started talking about here today. The Red Knockout, this is something Something that's proprietary to you. If you want to just discuss quickly kind of what the red knockout is, just so viewers know what the, what to expect. Yeah, yeah. Uh, John, who works with me and myself, we worked really, really hard on this momentum trading strategy. Uh, and we've done a bunch of back tests. And it's, it's a really, really great kind of swing trade setup that uh, we're, we've got some really good results with. And uh, yeah, I can't wait to share with you. Great. Um, so we're going to kind of mix it up with some of the work that Dan and his team have been doing on a technical perspective, as well as on a, on a trading perspective. So the third one he's going to be using, he's going to talk about is using volatility to gain an edge, perhaps getting diving into some of the stuff that we talked about here today about using implied volatility and how you can kind of really optimize your strategies around that. And also how to find short squeeze candidates, something that I've never covered here before. So you're going to get, uh, you know, a, a different perspective from, from Dan, not just the typical uh, topics on options trading, talking about short squeezes. And lastly, uh, um, Dan, you're going to be talking about uh, time spreads if we do, if you do get a chance to do that fifth session here for us. So we're going to, you know, the schedule is a bit un, in flight here over the next couple of weeks, but know that as soon as the baby comes, you will not lose your options education. Dan will be here to support you guys and make sure that you guys have uh, ongoing education every single week. Um, so with that, Dan, thank you so much for joining me today. If you don't mind, let's open this up for a few questions before we wrap this up for today. So if you have any questions for Dan or I, please type your questions into the Q&A section and I'll try to answer as many questions as we have time for here today. Um, Dan, here's a question. And you know, this is a question that we kind of get a lot about liquidity, right? And I think liquidity is always something that investors are concerned about. Um, it, HP is saying, I know we should only trade highly liquid underlyings, but is there a calculation that tells you how many contracts you can easily trade? I've heard some market makers use a percentage of daily volume. If daily volume is a million shares and 1% of the volume, the most you can trade would be 10,000 shares or 100 option contracts. Any thoughts on kind of as when you're a market maker, uh, you know, relative to the underlying stocks volume, kind of how liquidity works? Sure. Um, I would say that for probably 99% of the traders watching this here today, um, it is literally listed on your screen. What I do in my option chain is I set one of the columns to size, 
Um, some platforms require you to have the bid size and the ask size, but that literally shows you the number of contracts that are on the bid that you can sell. Like, for example, we were talking about those uh, Ford November 19th, 15 and a half calls. There's 24 of those contracts bid at 61 cents. There are 20 of those contracts offered at 63 cents. If I want to sell 24 of them, I can. It's, it says it right there. If I want to buy 20 of them at 63 cents, I can. It's, it's there published on the screen for you. Now, for the traders who trade a little bit bigger, you know, I'm sure there are some traders here in the audience who maybe you trade 100 contracts or 200 contracts at a crack, and you need to know, are there any more than 20? Typically, they, there are. And in my experience, um, you know, the, the math that you have here could work, but in my experience, it sort of depends on the underlying. The really liquid ones, um, Apple, spiders, that kind of thing. I mean, you can sometimes get 10 times what's shown. Uh, in the really illiquid ones, as soon as that first 20 is gone, they're gonna move the market by five cents because the, the, the back and forth trading we talked about earlier isn't there. And, and the market makers don't wanna get um, run over, right? They don't wanna to sell too much that they can't get out of. Um, so yeah, for a typical trader, Put the size of the bid and the ask on your screen, and and there's your answer in black and white. Um, and and thank you so much for that answer. And to kind of this this other question that came up, talking about market makers getting run over. Do market makers trade against other market makers? You know, generally not, but but sometimes, um, especially on like expiration days, because remember there's a lot of back and forth trading right if if the if the volume in some option is a thousand that doesn't mean that the market makers are all short a thousand some market makers are long some are short and on expiration day market makers love to close their positions and and have zero options on in the expiring expiration because anything can happen right they don't want to get pinned they don't want to get surprise assignments and so um so in those cases, what, what you'll see sometimes is a lot of mid-market trading, and the ones that are short might put in a, a, a bid to buy above everybody else's bid, and the ones that are long might see those and say, oh yeah, I'm gonna, I, I, I'm gonna sell those so that I can get out of my longs, and, and, and it's a benefit for both of them, um, and, and you know, it's just mid-market trading. But, uh, but yeah, the, like that's one example when a market maker might trade with another market maker. Um are humans still involved or all at all in computer driven market making these days? <laughs> um, well, somebody programs those computers. Uh, so the answer is yes. It's just, you know, like back in the eighties, I remember, yes, I remember the eighties. Uh, you know, I remember people talking about, you know, like the, the automakers really getting those factories and, and replacing, uh, you know, people working at those factories with robotics, right? Uh, the older folks in the audience like me remember that, right? Well, it, the exact same thing happened in market making. We replaced a lot of the labor and a lot of the manual and sometimes physical work with computers that can think faster, that can do these calculations faster, that can change the volatilities faster. So, so yes, there's absolutely humans involved, uh, but they leverage technology to do their job better. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for that for that clarity. Uh, the richer is asking, what's the difference between the natural and mid price? Uh, the richer, the natural price is referring to the bid ask price. The mid price is simply a calculated value. It's the average of these two prices. The mid price is not actually a value that's displayed anywhere or uh, you know, provided by anyone. It's something that's calculated from the bid and ask price. So when you refer to someone referring to the natural price, that's the bid ask price that's actually quoted on the screens. And the mid price is what we calculate as an average of the two to try to estimate what the fair value or the theoretical value of an option is. So most screens will show you both bid ask and can calculate a theoretical value or a midpoint for you on most trading platforms. Um, 
Dor- Dorothy's asking a good question. I don't know if you f- if you uh, want to answer this, but he, you know, Mr. Gensler, the the chairman of the SEC today, just was talking about dark pools. Um, he seems to feel that these are detrimental to good fill prices. Um, Dan, do you want to just expand on what are dark pools? Yeah, so a, a dark pool is like off exchange trading. Uh, a dark pool is um, like like a like a big trader might might literally call up their representative at Goldman Sachs and say, look, I want to buy a million shares or or a thousand options or whatever it is. And and Goldman Sachs will say, okay, you're filled. We're taking the other side of that. And it'll never trade on the exchange. Now, are they detrimental to good fill prices? It's another thing like payment for order flow where someone could argue both sides I personally, I personally like transparency in my life and, and especially in the markets. And so I would like to see things all traded on an exchange for everyone to see what's happening. And I feel uh, viscerally that that is the most fair way to do things. But you know, notwithstanding that someone could have another opinion, we could have a really, really great philosophical conversation about it. But yeah, I. I prefer to see things trade 100 percent on listed exchanges. Um, thank you, thank you for that. Um, and, and I think that on the other side of that coin, an institution who's trying to purchase a large block of stock or options will say, "I don't want that transparency. I want that off the exchange. I don't want anyone to know that I'm acquiring these shares, nor do I want to impact um, or have that information leaked out and market makers move the pricing as a result of it. So th- that's the other side of the equation, right? As to whether or not at the end of the day, it, it's good or bad. I think there's, there's, it's very nuanced and hard to, to say one way or another. Um, uh, just curious uh, from Gregory, how does one become a market maker? <laughs> a, a string of bad decisions, Gregory. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, no, it's it's a fascinating career. It really is. Um, there these days, there there are firms out there that are that are market making firms, and and they employ traders to to you know um, sometimes program computers. Like there are a lot of people who their role as a market maker is is they they program, and then there are those who sort of oversee and they trade and some they manage risk. So the best way to do it. Is to is to get a job with one of these market making firms. To to be an individual as a market maker these days, it's not possible. It might have been twenty years ago, but it's not. And, and now there's only a few market making firms, so you uh, you know there's not that not many to choose from. Um, so it's you can you can find a target, and if that's what you like to do, um, these are pretty big organizations. Um, great question here from Daniel about does market maker Delta hedging happen right after each trade or is it only executed sort of at the end of the day? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so Daniel, I would say that most market makers hedge it immediately following because if you don't, like what could happen is I, I could I could buy these calls and I have to short some stock, but but what if what if that stock goes down and I end up having to sell the stock at a much lower price? I mean, I could get lucky and the stock could go up and I could sell at a higher price, but market makers don't like luck. Market makers aren't the gamblers. Market makers are the casino, right? Um, and, and I could make a case for saying that us retail traders can turn ourselves into the casino in a different way too, but that's a subject for another day. So most of them will hedge immediately following. Now, I have spoken with some of the larger market makers and market making firms who have, who have tried different techniques with this and, you know, and maybe did just try hedging at the end of the day, figuring in the long run, uh, given, you know, statistics, it should all work out the same. Um, but me personally, I, I always did it immediately following the trade. Yeah. And I think a different asset classes are different. You know, if you look at some of the FX shops, they're more likely to do end of day because a lot of the volume tends to balance itself out throughout the day. Um, so it, 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 there's no right or there's no firm answer on that. Um, Sandra, your question about will Dan sessions be recorded and sent out to us as well? And the answer to that is yes, all of our sessions are recorded, but we will make the slides and the recording available to you afterwards. Um, Let's see. 
why are some options priced 40 cent difference between the strike price and some 70 cents, for example, different difference between strikes? Um, Julia, I don't know if you're asking, I mean, 40 to 70 cents doesn't sound like the, the strike prices differentials. I think that's that's perhaps looking at the, the difference between the bid ask price. I think Julia is asking, why are some strikes perhaps 40 cents wide and why are some other strikes 70 cents wide? Um, you know, kind of what is the thinking behind that? Mm -hmm. So, Julie, if you were going to make a trade, okay, like let's 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 say you were given a choice between two trades, trade A and trade B, okay. Trade A has very little risk. Trade B has much bigger risk. Which one would you require a bigger profit on? And and the answer is totally intuitive. Everybody's going to answer this the same way. If I take on more risk, I need more reward. Right. There's always that that direct correlation. And that's what it is. One of the biggest risks to market makers is that hedge that we were just talking about, which is why I always hedged immediately afterwards. If I buy those calls here, that means I've got to sell this stock here to, to lock in that theoretical profit. If the stock is here and I sell it, I might be locking in a theoretical loss. So stocks that move around a lot or stocks that are like um, I have that execution risk. I have that risk that the stack can move in a fraction of a second and I get a worse fill price as a market maker. So when there's a bigger delta, like that, if you look, there's, there's a pattern to it. If there's a bigger delta, the market maker has more execution risk. And so because of that, if the market moves, he can lose a lot more money having to sell at that lower price. And, and so, so the market maker has to have more reward to compensate him or herself for that more risk. Um, great, I, I think that's a really good um, answer to kind of your question. Uh, Sack is asking, why are some options, uh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but why are some options quoted in nickel inc increments, but you see that the last price was actually executed at a price outside of those nickel incre increments, uh, you know, in penny increments, kind of how does that work? Um, yes, I mean, I think there could be a couple of reasons for that. Um, you know, like one, for example, if it was traded as part of a spread, um, it, it could be in not nickel increments. Um, I mean, that's the first example that comes to mind, but, uh, sp you know, spreads can trade in, in, in pennies in some cases like that. Also just price improvement. You know, you can put in an order at 25 cents and get filled at 24 cents. Um, that's, that's the price improvement that, uh, effectively allows for payment for order flow, right? When we talk about how is it, how is payment for order flow legal? Why are firms allowed to sell their, uh, their their flow to market makers that trade against your order? It's because market makers can, in theory, as long as they pr give you price improvement or give you a better price, that's how they're able to, uh, to justify, if you will, uh, payment for order flow. So let's see if we can do a couple of more questions before we wrap this up. Jeff's asking a great question. I don't know that there's necessarily a definitive answer to it, but he's asking, do market makers fire fire off algorithms at different times? It seems every day at around 350 and SPY, the volume spikes and the bid ask spreads widen for a few seconds. Is that market makers playing a game or is there other big players? I think, but I do think this is a good question because you know, I, I also, I, I get questions from traders a lot. You know, should I trade in the first, uh, you know, 10 minutes of trading or should I avoid trading the last 10 minutes of trading? And I think this is a good question to kind of address. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, one thing I'll say, Jeff, is, you know, when you see patterns like this, maybe there's a way that you can figure out how to make money from it. Right. And it'll take a little bit of thinking. But um, what you're describing here, I would say is, is, highly unlikely to be initiated by a market maker uh, could be initiated by some sort of institutional trader. Because remember, like one of the most important takeaways that was sort of subtext in our conversation here is that market makers don't create vol uh, volume. Market makers don't create volume. They don't initiate trades. They absorb the trades, right? Tr traders like, like, you guys, me, Tony, in big institutional traders, they are the ones who come in and make a trade with the mark makers. They, they act 
market makers react. So if there's a spike in volume, that's not the market makers doing anything. That's that's some trader coming in and taking the offer or hitting the bid of one of the market makers. And, and naturally, if there is a volume spike, the market makers bid ask spreads will widen to protect themselves, right? Because I mean, the market maker, you know, like I made the reference that market makers are like casinos. Um, a casino would love to see like 10 million people throughout the year come and play $25 hands of blackjack back and forth. What they don't want is to open up their doors one day a year and have one big uh, gambler come in and gamble a billion dollars on one gamble, right? Because that's that's gambling. They can they can lose big. Um, and and so that's what it, you know. That's why if a big trade comes in, market makers going to widen those bid ask spreads because they don't want to like all of a sudden trade fifty thousand contracts all at one price. Like that could be detrimental. That could be career ending. So may, maybe that's what you're seeing. Um, I think that's very likely. And, and, and I mean, and this brings up kind of another, I would say benefit of payment for order flow because it allows market makers to segment the retail flow from this institutional flow. And they're more likely to trade against your orders and know that, hey, I'm not going to get run over by some institution here by providing a tight quote or a tight bid ass spread. And I think that's really, you know, again, another nuance part of, of payment for order flow. So Dan, let's, add, let's, let's end this with one great question. I think this is a really good question and I, there's not a great answer to it, but I, I'm gonna pose this to you uh, anyway. Do you think you would get a better price with a limit order or a market order? <laughs> oh man, if you asked me five years ago or longer, I would have said 100% limit order. Now I just feel like it doesn't really matter yet. Uh, I am, admittedly, I am a little bit old school and I still use limit orders. I don't know if, I don't know if there's really a reason to anymore. I mean, um, you know, the, we do see this price improvement with a lot of firms. And, and I think if you put in a market order with some of those firms, you're gonna get filled better than the natural. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that is a great question, uh, Robert, but, I, my guess, if we, I think if we were to do, do a study, I don't know if it would matter. Um, I, I will caveat that. And, and I will say that I, I think it's the old school traders that trade. With, I, I think that's what you were saying is the old school traders trade with uh, limit orders. Um, I will caveat what, with what you just said is that I think what you said is true in pretty much most of the top four or 500 liquid names. I think once you get into the not very liquid names, I would absolutely suggest that you use a market order, not a, not a, I'm sorry, use a limit order, not a market order. But when you're trading the liquid stuff, right? And on options play, you have a liquidity indicator here. So for any symbol you type in, it'll either tell you very liquid, somewhat liquid, and not liquid at all. The very liquid stuff, placing a market order, I generally feel pretty comfortable doing that. I know I'll get filled pretty immediately and I'll get pretty much at a fair price, sometimes usually at the midpoint or sometimes even potentially better than the midpoint on, on trades with a market order. Um, but if I'm trading something that's not very liquid, specifically something that's not liquid at all, I will never place a market order. So we'll leave it at that. Um, with that, Dan, thank you so much for your time here this afternoon. I think this is extremely enlightening for everyone here uh, to be able to get a different perspective. And I think everyone here is really uh, is going to have a fantastic time having you uh, provide some, uh, you know, your insights and your way of teaching here of options education over the next uh, month or so. The baby is technically due on November 6th. So hopefully that's the timeline that we're going to stick to. And Dan will come in uh, the week after November 6th, but we are planned at this point to transition at any time. So I did want to have the session so you guys are familiar with who he is so that when he jumps on, you're, you'll know who he is. And I hope you guys give him a big welcome when he does take over. With that, thank you so much. And I hope you guys have a great trading day. And Dan, I don't know if you want to say any closing words before we wrap up here today. Yeah, I, I really can't wait uh, to to have the honor of being the instructor in your classes and uh, and meeting you all on a more personal level. And so uh, thank you. I can't wait to, to share some time with you. Thank you so much, guys. I hope you guys have a great trading day and I'll see you guys here next week on our Tuesday morning Market Outlook session. Have a great trading day.